So before I came to Hong Kong, I had this idea. Uh, this idea that Hong Kong would be like a city in the clouds. Well, okay, not, not literally, but see, what I had in mind were the tall office buildings and the swanky shopping malls of Central. Now that's what I was thinking about. And with those thoughts also came a fear. Because I thought that while surely I would appreciate these buildings, this, these architecture, for their magnificent beauty, I was also afraid that it would be a little too much for me. That this urban jungle would prove overwhelming and I would be left longing for some more homely qualities. You know, the things that made me love the places I lived before. Now obviously, the problem with having that many assumptions about a place before you even go there is that you'll soon find out that most of them are totally inaccurate. And I was certainly rethinking all those thoughts about six months after I arrived in the city when I visited the, the district of Sham Shui Po for a school assignment. Now this was June, like mid-June, and I trust all of you down here who have experienced the summer in Hong Kong will know what I'm talking about. Because that day it was raining. And by raining, I mean it was pouring. So obviously I felt like it was probably a good idea to pause my assignment and just hide from the rain for a bit. So I ducked into one of the many countless local shops just scattered around the district. And I sat at the storefront just waiting for the rain to die down a bit. And while I was sitting there, my attention was captured by this creature from across the street. So there I was sitting, and then all of a sudden, I noticed this thing just right across the street from me. And even though it was raining and raindrops were sliding down its surface, it had this beauty to it, this liveliness that was totally unaffected by the rain. And more specifically, I was gazing into its eyes. It had white dots as pupils and black sclera, which was a really unusual match, for, uh, I thought because it gave me a feeling like I was gazing into the night sky. Now what this thing was, was it was essentially a whole Pantone color charts where the paint splattered onto one massive three-story high, three-side wide canvas. And as you can tell, I was very interested in this creature. And later on, when I got home, I felt the need to do some research about it. So after Googling some basic stuff, I learned that this piece a dog created by Spanish artist Okuda San Miguel, entitled Rainbow Thief, was indeed one of the more famous pieces of work in what had been a growing movement of street art in Sham Shui Po. Now that really captured my attention. Because on the one hand, I like street art as it is. I'm a person who appreciates the value of art, and I've always thought street art was this really cool way for people to express their ideas in a way they see fit and without a lot of restriction. But on the other hand, it's the fact that this movement was going on in Sham Shui Po that really drew my attention because I had heard a lot about this place. See, ever since its conception in about the 1920s as a commercial hub, Sham Shui Po has had this nickname among local circles who've called it the other side of Hong Kong. And I think that's a fitting name. Because on the one hand, the district is one of Hong Kong's poorest. People there struggle on a daily basis, and a lot of them have trouble with even basic housing. But on the other hand, Sham Shui Po has also had a history as one of Hong Kong's liveliest districts. In the 70s and 80s, traditional festival celebrations, like the ones shown here, used to draw in tons of people from both other parts of the city and from abroad. The unique mix of traditional Chinese festival celebrations and Sham Shui Po's growing night scene with all its fluorescent lights and towering structures made it a tourist hotspot. But see, I must admit, walking the streets of Sham Shui Po that day for my assignment, I couldn't help but feel disappointed because everywhere I looked, it just seemed so, well, boring. A lot of the paint, which had been done decades ago, had begun fading at this point. And the structures of the old buildings themselves had begun to peel a bit. And all that color and vibrancy I had heard about was no more. I walked the streets and everywhere I could see were gray, 
light gray, dark gray, well, all sorts of different shades. But as I was walking that day, I thought, this didn't live up to the legacy I was promised. And I think maybe that's why I was really drawn to Rainbow Thief that day, because it was just so refreshing to see that burst of color in this place that had seemed where color had faded. And apparently, I wasn't the only one who thought that. In fact, I was far from the only one who thought that. And that was why HK Walls, a Hong Kong-based organization whose aim is to create opportunities for artists to express themselves through the medium of street art, decided back in 2015 to pick the district as the location for their annual festival. And HK Walls got over 40 artists, both from Hong Kong and abroad, and they sent them to work on this map right here within the, within the district. All the spots were pieces of art created during the festival. So once I found out about this, I realized I had to contact the artists and ask them how it felt to work on this, to be a part of a project like that, to be within the Sham Shui Po space. So I reached out to several of them through social media and email. And after a long series of getting rejected and or ignored, uh, the details of which I will not go into here, <laughs> one specific artist, uh, an Italian artist by the name of Pita, finally responded to some of my questions on Instagram. And Pita, back, back in 2015, created this work here, which has also gained some reputation. And I suppose it can best be described as scribbles made into geometric shapes across, a two side, uh, across two sides of a building. So I reached out to Pita and I asked him how he felt about working in Sham Shui Po and what was the experience like. And he told me that it was a real challenge for him. He said that it was the, obviously the largest scale project that he had ever worked on throughout his career. And that the whole anamorphic nature of it and just the fact that he could paint on an entire building, that just really drew him to the project. And it's that first word that he used, the fact that he said challenge, that's what stuck for me. Because I felt like that encapsulated a lot of the artist's attitude towards Sham Shui Po. For them, Sham Shui Po, with all its crumbling walls or decrepit buildings, was essentially a district-wide painting ground. It was a large canvas for them to imprint onto it their legacy and what their, their artistic talent. And by doing so, they could imbue this old district with some new color. And isn't that just the most wonderful thing ever? But see, at the end of the day, when you're a street artist, you commission your massive painting, you get it all done, then you pack up your tools, take out your bucket list, cross off painting on a three-story high building, off of that list, then you're ready to go, either back to other parts of Hong Kong or other countries. But the people of Sham Shui Po, they're the ones who now, when they leave their homes in the morning, have to deal with cartoonish caricatures and mythological beasts. So it being a people's district and all, I decided it's better to get the other side and to ask some of Sham Shui Po's citizens how they felt. So I went back to the district and I started with the lady. Uh, a shopkeeper whose shop I was hiding under the day I first discovered Rainbow Thief. So I asked her, as a citizen and as a business owner here, what she felt about this phenomenon that has been going on, you know, whether or not she felt like it was a good addition to the district. And I was a little shook by her response, honestly. Um, she said that, yes, although she appreciated the fact that the artists brought some color and some vibrancy to the district, it didn't really do much for her and for her business. Specifically, she said that, while yes, I do appreciate the effort that these artists are making to add some color, because there's no real marketing present, even if more people come to the district, doesn't mean they're gonna come to my shop. And, well, I was a little shook by that. I was really expecting that all this art, which I had loved, would have created a more positive impact on these people. But I figured one was obviously too small a sample size. So I kept going and I went to some other local stores. And unsurprisingly, I guess, a lot of the owners echoed her sentiments. In fact, there was one shopkeeper who I remember very clearly, and I knew he understood my responses. But even though he was nodding as I asked the question, when it was his turn to reply, 
He simply shook his head and sighed. And looking around his shop, I could tell that he was used to a lack of customers. Well, after all that, I was feeling unsatisfied and a bit more puzzled, even. So I decided that this would not stop here, and I would keep asking more people. And eventually, I just kind of resorted to aimlessly wandering around the streets of Sham Shui Po and just stopping random passerby to ask them about the street art thing. And uh, obviously, a lot of people ignored me, but there was one man's response who I remember really clearly. It was a guy on his way to work, and I told him about what he, what I asked him what he felt about the art, about the situation, and I also told him what the shopkeepers had previously told me. And he gave a really thoughtful response. He said that, well, yes, he definitely understands the shopkeeper's perspective, and as business owners, this didn't do much to them. But he said that he, as a longtime resident of the district, used to feel like his mornings were boring. He would leave his home, he would go to the MTR for work. And on his way there, all he could see within sight were the same things I saw the first time I went to Sham Shui Po. Gray, dull, lifeless. And that made his mornings gloomy. But ever since all this art came in and appeared on streets and on corners and on walls, he said that his mornings had become a little bit brighter. That as he left his home to go to work, he could appreciate the colors and the cartoons and the caricatures and the vibrancy. And that made his mornings a bit brighter. And by extension, made his day a bit happier. So he said that no matter what else, he at least can say as a citizen of the district that he does appreciate the art that has been made here. And after listening to that, I was brought back to another moment the day I first saw Rainbow Thief in June. So let's, let's pull back for a second. So I was there, I was sitting at the storefront and I was looking across the street, gazing into those white pupils and black slur. And then all of a sudden there was this like wagging motion. There was a tail brushing against me. So I looked down, I looked down and I saw there was in fact a second dog. Although this one was a real dog. It was the shopkeeper's dog. And it's a real friendly creature, and it came up to me, nudged, it, nudged its head against me, and I petted it a little bit. And the reason I was brought back to that specific moment after listening what the man had to say was because I felt like it was actually half-decent metaphor for what I felt was the whole situation surrounding street art. Because in these streets of Sham Shui Po, you had two dogs. There was one dog who was towering, magnificent with all its beauty. And you had this other dog. Well, it may be less visually impressive or perhaps aesthetically pleasing. It was real and alive. And with that came a sense of homeliness. See, no one is denying the good intentions of the artist. But whether their particular bland, brand of flamboyance suits the district, well, that's a separate question entirely. And frankly, through my efforts and because of the mixed results I got, I can't provide you an answer to what Sham Shui Po as a whole thinks about street art. However, through my interviews, I felt that the people there, though their responses may be mixed, that everyone was striving towards what they thought was a better version of their lives. And my biggest takeaway from this little journey I went on, and really the core of what I want to share to you all today, is the great stories that can come from this unique blend of artistry and pragmatism in the district of Sham Shui Po. It's the people and the stories that have made Hong Kong feel like a new home for me. It's what makes me love the city, and it's what has made it so much more than just a city in the clouds. Thank you for your time. <laughs>